What central theme runs through all the Bible? How would you respond, Jesus, the plan of salvation? The cross, yes to all three, of course, but these three important topics unfold against another all-encompassing theme. The great controversy, this theme pervades the Bible, from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, the great controversy began in heaven with Lucifer's rebellion against God. At the heart of this cosmic conflict is the issue of God's love. Hello, welcome once again to Whispering Hope Daily Sabbath School Lesson Review. We are so delighted that you continue to be ardent viewers and supporters of this ministry. You know, just a few years ago, this ministry started and it has grown all because of you, our viewers, who have shared the word. You have continued to share the link and invite others and you have commented and you have caused this word of God to grow in leaps and bounds. So we are very appreciative of the fact that you continue to be supporters of Whispering Hope. This morning, as usual, we continue in the study of the week's lesson, and we're getting close to the end of the quarter. And so we are going to see what the lesson has in store for all of us today as we get into today's discussion. With me today, we have the wonderful Elder Jacqueline Gordon, but Elder Andy David is on off on assignment today, so we have in his place, we have the indomitable Pastor Orville Joseph. And so these two are going to be bringing to us today the insights and the foresights even into the lesson that we're going to be studying. Well, we're at lesson number 11. It's the 11th week of the quarter, and that means we're winding down. And the lesson is entitled, The Impending Conflict. But let's stop at this moment to just have Elder Gordon and Pastor Joe just Greet the folks who are viewing this morning on Whispering Hope. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Happy to be here as usual. Good morning, Elder Joseph and Pastor Joseph. So it's wonderful when we have a pastor in our midst. And welcome, everyone, and Whispering Hope family. Indeed, God will truly bless, continue to bless us as we go into his word. Amen. Always good to see you, Elder Gordon. Pastor Joe, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm pretty good. It's great to be on with two illustrious Bible students, uh, Bible scholars, and it is my joy to be here. I envy being in this position. Nonetheless, I'll try to do my best. I know I'm feeling, feeling big shoes. I know Elder da uh, David is out this morning, and so I have to fit in for him. But I'm least among the apostles, and I'm glad for the opportunity to be here. All right. Well, we're all least among, so I don't know which one is the least. So we'll, <laughs> <laughs> we'll move forward from there. <laughs> Elder Gordon, just give us a prayer as we are about to open God's word. And then I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Joe to bring us the memory text so we get some insights. Then we move forward into Tuesday's lesson. Let us pray, Almighty God and our Heavenly Father. Lord, we are so thankful. Thankful for the gift of life. Thankful for your word, your word of truth, oh God, that can set all of us free today. And as we get into your word, we invite your Holy Spirit to guide, God, teach, oh God, teach us so that we can be edified, we can be enriched, we can be further empowered to do your will so that we can make it to live with you throughout the ceaseless edges of eternity. So grant us your blessing, your joy, and your peace, and bless all Whispering Hope family as they all tune in to be enriched by the word of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Give us some memory text, Pastor Joe. Okay, so our memory text is taken from John 17, 17, and it says, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth, the New King James Version. That's a very terse memory text, Pastor Joe, very short and concise. <laughs> um, I don't know how much you can extract from that in relation to, we've been studying for the quarter, the great controversy, and this week's lesson is talking about the impending conflict. Um, if, you, if you could give us some insights into the title itself, the impending conflict, and how does the memory text fit in or anything you can just give us insights into the memory text in terms of our study for today. So the title for our lesson study this week indicates that there is an impending conflict. There's a conflict that's looming. Well, it's already brewing, I would say. And that is the conflict between truth and error. And it is going to come to a head where individuals, all the inhabitants of the earth, will have to choose on which side they stand on, whether they stand on the side of truth or whether they stand on the side of error. I think in Revelation, we are open up to the idea that those who stand on the side of truth 
will be sealed by God. And those who stand on the side of error will demonstrate that they have the mark of the beast, uh, which is essentially a part of what we're going to be studying today. But Jesus in his prayer, I like to refer to this as the Lord's prayer, as well as the disciples' prayer. Jesus says in John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Uh, he's talking to his father. And the word sanctify, we know, is a word that is also translated set apart. My interpretation of this would that Jesus is asking God to make his people distinctive by uh, identifiable by the truth that they follow, by the truth that they hold dear to, by the fact that they are willing to give their lives for the truth. That is the distinguishing mark of the people of God. It is not by accident that the servant of the Lord says that the sealing of God's people is the settling of the truth in the mind. And so the truth is an essential part of who we are as believers in God. We cannot afford to flirt with error or falsehood or, or half-truth. We have got to maintain and follow the full truth as it is in Jesus Christ. Excellent. Thank you so much, Pastor Joe, for that. You know, I, I quite agree because in terms of what you said about the Lord's Prayer, we, we often look at the Lord's Prayer in the Bible as, you know, how the disciples came to him and they asked him how to pray and he, he taught them how to pray. But this prayer in John chapter 17, I've come to understand and to accept it as the prayer that Jesus is praying praying for all of us, his disciples and those down to the corridors of time. And so this is the prayer of the Lord, the way I put it, the Lord's prayer, praying for his disciples and praying for all those who would be following him down to the corridors of time. So excellent. We are sanctified by the truth. He prays that we are going to be set apart with and for the truth. And indeed, when we are in that position, then we will be settled into the truth, as Ellen G. White puts it, and therefore we will be sealed. So Tuesday's lesson, coming now to Tuesday, June the 11th, the lesson is entitled Identifying the Beast, Part 1. So that means tomorrow, all of our viewers on Whispering Hope tuning for Part 2 on Wednesday's lesson of Identifying the Beast. Our objective this morning, Pastor and Elder Gordon, is to identify the beast in this preliminary stage or this first part of the study. And um, I know it's very easy for us to take the whole thing and run with it, but let's try as much as possible to leave something for tomorrow for the guys who are coming on as they do that discussion as well. So Identifying the Beast, Part 1. And Elder Gordon, coming to you, you know that the Bible talks about peace and some people are fearful of reading the book of Revelation because it talks about beasts and dragon and all these things. And some people say they find it so hard to understand. And really, it's all in codes and there's nothing there much about Jesus Christ. But the, the title of the book is The Revelation of Jesus Christ. Whether it's the revelation that Jesus Christ gave to John or the revelation of Jesus Christ, who he is himself, it could be either one or both. But let's look at today's topic in detail because we're going to that very same book of the god revelation chapter 13 verses 1 and 2 i'd like you to read those two verses for us please and then i'm going to ask you the question as to where does this beast that revelation talks about where, where does it rise from and who gives it authority because after all the beast has authority and we're just trying to identify the beast in today's lesson so read for us Revelation 13, verses 1 and 2. Yes, and reading from the King James Version, verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard and his feet were as the feet of a bear and his mouth as the mouth of a lion and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his authority mm -hmm. and the question is elder gordon is where does this beast rise from and who gives it authority well as the bible revelation itself speaks to that it says that the beast came from the sea and we know in prophecy that sea represents multitude people so it come among people but he came from the sea and his his authority was given by the dragon by satan himself so it is satan himself is the mastermind behind the beast power which represents kingdoms 
kings. So with the beast representing kings, the sea, multitudes of people, and the power came from Satan. So we see Satan is the mastermind behind the authoritative body who seeks to rule and govern and enact laws whereby people are to administer according to the laws enacted. All right, thank you so much, Elder God. So we see there that the beast got his power from the dragon, and you're you saying to us that the dragon is, is Satan himself. Now, Pastor Joe, how did this uh, practically work out? I don't believe that anyone actually saw the devil in person giving power to an uh, indescript or nondescript beast, so to speak, and we know these are symbolic things. So help those who have challenges in understanding Revelation and the beast and the symbolism and so on. How did this actually play out in, in, on this earth in terms of who is the beast and the dragon and, and what power was given? And how, how did all this happen? How did he get to power? If we go back to, to Daniel and Daniel saw the various kingdoms that rule, uh, that rule up until the kingdom of this world become the kingdom of our God, where the stone is cut out without hand and grew into a kingdom, which is the kingdom of our God. And so if you go back to that point and we see the main, the four kingdoms, Babylon, Media, Prussia, Greece, and Rome. So we come to Rome and, and it is the last earthly power as established by Daniel. And as Rome loses its effectiveness and power, it created a vacuum. And just let me go back and say that those kingdoms are the kingdoms of this world. That those kingdoms are the kingdoms that follow the agenda of the arch enemy, the dragon and Satan. So when Rome created that vacuum, when pagan Rome created that vacuum, it made it possible for the rise of Papal Rome. And so uh, with the rise of Papal Rome, which, which was the dominant church at the time, it took on its spiritual power and authority, and it also took on the secular power that was once a pagan Rome. And so it is in that light that we see that the, the Roman church gained its authority and power. And it is not one that is ascribed to it by or, or given to it by God, but is one that's given to it by the devil himself. Meaning that Rome itself, by the way it behaved and exercised its power and authority, demonstrated that it was an instrument of evil rather than an instrument of good. And that is the defining thing, especially as we come to talk about the end of time and the final and the conflict, that we demonstrate where we at and where we get our power based on who we give allegiance to. And so that is exactly what was happening to, to the Roman power. It gave its allegiance to falsehood and evil and to oppressing others and to destroying the word of God and to exalt itself above God to an extent and claim rights and, and power that belongs only to God. And so it clearly identified itself as that power that the dragon empowers to get its work done all right so if you were to take it in stages what you have said pastor joe is that there was pagan rome meaning the the government or the seat of government those are political persons who was in authority and there was a vacuum as you put it meaning that there was a moving or a space that was available for someone to rule because i believe history has shown us that the ruler of Rome then, of the Roman Empire, was Constantine, and that Constantinople was developed in another place. He moved it from above. And so that vacuum was filled. Now, my question is, in filling the vacuum, in having, I'm coming to you, Elder Gordon, in having or putting in place, instead of another political appointee or the deputy, there was no deputy uh, crown or, or Caesar, you put in place a religious system or a person. Elder Gordon, what's working behind Constantine to appoint the church, the Pope or the Bishop of Rome to such power? Is it purely a human endeavor to do so or is there something or someone else working behind of the reason for Constantine giving this such great authority to a religious uh, institution? I think your question goes back to Revelation chapter 2, 13 verse 2. And the beast which I saw, like a dragon, and his feet were like the feet of a bee, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon, which is Satan, gave his power and his seat, and that's the vacant seat that we are referring to there, 
great authority. And as Pastor Joseph rightfully set the pace here to says, it was once pagan Rome being ruled or governed by the political power, so to speak, which is Constantine at the time, because Rome, Rome was a superpower at the time. And then with all what he has said, dear, the vacancy now that was caused by Constantine removing his power there, it means now that a bishop, the, the Pope, the Roman Catholic Church, took that seat. Now, when you have a man of God who should be proclaiming God's word, whose authority should be the thus says the Lord, and I think this is why our memory text speak to sanctify them to like truth, thy word is truth stick to the truth so we have a marriage taking place now a religious political power taking place whereby satan the dragon was able now to we were able to implement his laws we were able to and as pastor joseph says as we go back to daniel where he seek to change times and laws he could not have done it without having his man his purpose his church being his representative. So we see what is playing out here is that Satan is the mastermind. He is sad to say, but he used the power, the seat of the church to fulfill or dictate his desire. And the desire is to wipe out the word of God, which can't happen, but that is his desire so that falsehood can take dominance. All right. Falsehood could take dominance. I'm listening to those words very carefully, Elder Gordon. Falsehood could take dominance. Pastor Joe, we look at the beast, we look at the dragon, we look at the vacancy and the seat that was given. And we're seeing here that it was given to a religious institution. Now, as we draw closer to the end of time on this earth, we know back then, of course, when that took place in the time of Constantine, that the children of God, those who were the followers of God, they were marginalized, they were sown asunder, they were thrown to animals, they were asked to recant, and this sect called Christianity was being taught that we had the dark ages and so on, where the light of Christ was taken away and darkness prevailed amongst, but there was, all, there was always a remnant that was there for, for Christ to carry out his word. And so we are here today in 2024, and we have the remnant that is still there carrying the torch of Christ. But here is it that we have in this time that the church had political power and the politicians or the government essentially had religious power. Pastor Joe, is it right? So is it God's design for church and state to be in bed with each other? And how potent or difficult or challenging is this as we approach the end of time in terms of the impending conflict that's going to take place? How do you see that influencing the outcome or the influences of what's taking place as we draw to the end of time because certainly everybody lives in a country of some sort and there's a government and there's religion and when we have that or those two commingling then pastor joe that to me spells a lot of trouble so it's always a challenge and trouble whenever you try to marry the secular and the religious uh, you, you remember there was a time when israel was a theocracy in other words god was seen as its spiritual leader and there were judges that carried out the secular responsibilities and so on but even in those times there were still the priests and prophets who would come who, who would carry out spiritual res responsibilities as well when you get into the kingdom even though the king was expected to ensure that spirituality was at its height and facilitate those who the prophets and the priests etc we find that there were some colossal failures with the king and and one of the most prominent one was Uzziah who felt that as king he could also carry out spiritual responsibility and we know that he was struck down with leprosy so there is always that struggle between those who hold secular power and even those who hold religious power trying to straddle the fence in other words and so it has been a disaster throughout the ages whenever these two powers come together these two authorities come together because essentially you know it requires a certain kind of compromise that, that the truth cannot kind of tolerate let me put it that way so let's take a digger for instance of where in the last few years there is this call for decriminalization of a particular substance and in order for for people to meet the popular demand 
in court. You have to sacrifice people's health and people's well-being, as the case may be, in order to satisfy a particular group. And those are some of the challenges that, that you experience when you have both trying to have its own sway. Let's take some of the religious entities today that are trying to maintain their influence and trying to maintain their influence. They accede to things like same-sex marriages, etc., etc. And so you see the kind of play and compromise where whenever both powers come together are, are in close proximity, that essentially truth is compromised. It is God's intent that truth never be compromised. And that is why it is God's way that he has his select individuals who would declare his truth on his behalf. And they are asked to focus exclusively on the declaration of the truth and not to seek political or secular power because their responsibility is to declare the everlasting gospel and to call people from the world from secularism into the presence of god and so anytime you merge that you destroy the truth the everlasting gospel that god is calling you to proclaim and that is the danger that is why i don't think it is god's design that the church should take on a political role or that the politicians to take on a spiritual role. I think it is God's design that the church carry out its function as a remnant church called to declare the everlasting gospel in these final days. That ought to be the ultimate, the only focus of the church and not become involved in the politics of the time. Yes, it is important, I think this pointed out somewhere in the lesson, that it is it becomes necessary for us as a people to respect government, to pay our taxes to Caesar, but never to become so involved that we take on authority that God doesn't want us to take on. All right. Thank you so much, Pastor Joe. Very passionate there in your explanation. Thank you so much for that. Hello, Gordon. I'm reading Revelation 13, verse 1 and 6. It says in Revelation 13, 1, it says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his head a blasphemous name. Verse 6 says, And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Now, I see the Elder God coming out in those two verses, the word blasphemous, blasphemy, blaspheme. And so the question I'm going to ask you as we round out lessons for today is that what key word is used in identifying the beast power? Now, the answer to that, of course, is blaspheme, is blasphemy. So then who is or what is the beast? We are identifying the beast part one for today. So we can't go without identifying the beast. In case those who are watching are not clear, I want you, Elder Gordon, to just based on those two texts and what we've discussed before, what is or who is the beast? The beast, as we have established, are kingdoms, uh, let me say in this specific area, kings. And we already recognize that the dragon is who gives power to the kings. Now, blasphemy is the common thread here. And why is that so pronounced blaspheme or blaspheming? And as we see the, the marriage between political and religious, they're coming together, they're gelling together. But the mastermind behind that is the dragon, is Satan. And why is Satan desirous of being in such a seat, giving such a power to the person who sits in that seat, which should represent the church? Because his desire is, and we know from Isaiah, we are even in heaven. When the war started in heaven, his desire was to usurp God's authority. He said, I will be like the most high. I will be this. And it's all the I factor within Satan that caused the war to be in heaven. And now we are experiencing it today. So his desire is to usurp God's authority, is to remove the whole concept of Jesus and what Jesus means to us sinners, reconciling his death, his resurrection, and so on. Satan wants to not just minimize, he wants to erode, to remove it. And so when he have this religious power sitting in the seat that 
to carry out his dictate, what we find that there's a transferal of him claiming to be God. And we know that for a fact, the history book tells us that. And some of us, once we would have been in certain religion, as I have, I experienced it where I had to confess my sins to the priest in order for me to be confirmed. I had to go in the room, kneel down before the priest, and renounce my sins, everything that I have done. And that priest would lay his hand, place his hand on my head, and the priest was, they said to me, I experienced it. He said to me, my sins are forgiven. I was young, I was youth, I didn't know truth, and so I really thought that my sin was forgiven by this priest. And so we see it, it's not something that the Bible, and it is so wonderful to see how God's word is truth, because the Bible says it, we experience it, and now that we are reading it and have a better understanding, we can understand where Satan now wants the church to take on that authority of God, claiming to have that authority of God and to forgive sins. Now we know that is the shedding of the blood. It is Christ's blood. Whosoever believe it be on God, if you confess my sins, I am faithful and able to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. In Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 8, he says, Though it come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, I, God, will make them white to snow. Though they be red like crimson, I can make them. And Satan wants all that to be removed so that he can get the praise, he can get the glory, and he will now renounce Jesus. And so this is the purpose of having the power, the religious power, sitting in the seat, recognizing that he has twofold, political and religious power. Alright, so I'm seeing there then that the religious power that is sitting in the seat of government, the religious power that got its power from political power from the government. That is who the Bible is referring to here as the beast. The beast is indeed blaspheming and continue to do so. And therefore, we identify from the word of God that this religious power with their teachings, their doctrines, their falsehood is actually the beast. It's not an individual, it's the system that is representing the beast. Pastor Joe, we are at the end of our study for today. Time has flown by real quickly. Just give us your takeaway on the study for today as we close out. As the people of God, we, we need to be mindful that the conflict is upon us and we need to stay anchored in the truth. We need to recognize that Jesus, as Elder Gordon would have mentioned, that, you know, staying with Christ, who is the lamb that takes away the sins of the world, who is the one who died for us, who is the one who forgive, gives us sins, that staying with Jesus Christ is all that we need to do, because it is he that endure it to the end, the same shall be saved. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Pastor Joe. And the final word to you, Elder Gordon. The ladies have the final say for today. Your takeaway for today's study. Yes, you recognize from the study that we are not fighting. This conflict is not on the outside. Oftentimes, we think we are safe and secure on the inside, regardless of what religious body we are are affiliated with. We tend to think that it's just outside there the battle is. But Satan is smarter than that. He has joined the church. And if the church doesn't speak, thus says the Lord, true. It means that it is blasphemy. It means that it is an error. So we must recognize that not because we are a part of a church, we must understand, as the Bereans did, search the scripture for ourselves so that we can recognize the truth and follow truth. Because when we have truth, indeed, only at that time we can experience freedom in Jesus. We want to thank you, Elder Gordon and Pastor Joseph, for bringing to us today insights into the study. We looked at identifying the beast part one. Please make sure that you tune in to Whispering Hope for part two in tomorrow's study on Wednesday, the 12th of June. Yes, the seat was given to the beast by the dragon. The dragon is identified in the word of God as Satan and the beast as extracted from the understanding in Revelation and elsewhere. That beast is a religious power that blasphemes the word of God. And so we have got to be so very mindful of who God is and what he stands for. The only thing that can guide us through 
and help us through to the end is the truth about God and to settle into his truth. We pray that you continue to view Whispering Hope and more so that you continue to study the word of God and let the Holy Spirit guide you in all that you do. So until we come to your way next time, may God bless you and have a wonderful morning.